Okay, one of the, well, actually, let me start that over. The most abundant phylum on the planet in terms of animals is the arthropods, arthropoda. This includes animals with an exoskeleton with uh, segmented legs, uh, not segmented legs, but jointed legs is what I want to say, and a segmented body plan. So let's look at this group. Uh, here's uh, an ancient form, the trilobites, that used to be one of the more dominant species on the planet, but they went extinct at the end of the uh, Paleozoic. Um, so arthropods uh, show up during the Cambrian explosion. Here's an example of one here. You can see that kind of segmented body and this exoskeleton and jointed appendages. Um, here we see uh, annelid worms. Uh, we can see sponges over here. We can see a chordate over here. We can see a cnidarian there and a flatworm there. We can see all of the phyla that we've been talking about uh, on the planet by the end of the Cambrian uh, time period, that Cambrian explosion. So arthropods are super successful. Why? Well, one thing is their exoskeleton is protective. They have a, a skeleton on the outside of their body, essentially, that their muscles connect to. It's protective, and it's made of chitin and proteins. We've seen chitin once before in the fungi, if you recall, um, in the cell walls of fungi. Now, these are animals that don't have cell walls, but their exoskeleton is composed of chitin, which is it's protective. It's waterproof, so it prevents them from drying out. So... What's cool about this is they evolved that in the ocean, but they already had legs in the ocean and they already had a waterproof skin, so that may have made coming out of the water a little bit easier for them. Um, so the chitin protects against dehydration, it acts as places for muscles to attach. Now, what are the disadvantages of having this exoskeleton? Well, you have to shed it every once in a while when you grow. You have to uh, secrete a new one, and that can make you vulnerable. And it could uh, be a little bit heavy, and uh, as you get bigger, it may uh, may be a disadvantage. But but it's been it's worked out pretty well for the arthropods, I'd say. Some of these organisms have been relatively unchanged over the last 500 million years, like this fossil horseshoe crab compared to a living one. Uh, their lifestyle and their habits. And their, their traits have worked really well, so well, that they haven't changed all that much. Um, so they have a protective exoskeleton. And it fossilizes well, so we know a lot about their past. Um, also, they have well-developed circulatory systems. There are open circulatory systems, like we've talked about before. They also have uh, a well-developed nervous system with eye, really highly developed eyes, uh, a brain, and uh, highly developed respiratory systems. Uh, we've talked about their trachea before. They have trachea that branch to tracheoles. And the opening uh, out here on the outside of the insect, those are called spiracles. Don't confuse those for spicules in the sponges, those skeletal structures. Spiracles are the openings to the tracheal system of insects, how they breathe. Um, if you've ever done organic gardening, you might spray your plants with soapy water to kill insects because it can block the spiracles and cause them to suffocate. Another thing that makes them so very well adapted to life on land are their jointed appendages. So they have legs, even like lobsters have legs, and they're aquatic. So uh, things that came out of the water early on had these jointed appendages, allowed them to invade the land well. It allows them to get around. If you've ever tried to chase a spider, you know how well those jointed appendages work. They really work well to for locomotion, for climbing, for things like that. Um, all of the arthropods you see on this image, as scary as they may be, are all native to Arkansas. Um, Black widow spiders, very common in my garage, as unfortunately are brown recluse spiders, also very common in my house and garage. Um, I've seen um, tarantulas uh, on the roads in Arkansas, but I see them crossing the roads. And scorpions you can find in the woods, like under rocks and logs and things. And some people I know have found them in their houses in Conway. Okay, another thing that makes them well adapted to life on land is their segmentation. And why that makes them well adapted is that the different body segments can evolve different functions. Okay, so their different body uh, segments can have different functions, allowing them to have specialized parts, like the claws of the lobster here, and the tail at one end, or the body plan of a, of a crab, or um, uh, of, a, of a sow bug here, which is actually a crustacean. I don't know if you knew that or not. Uh, these are actually closely related to lobsters and shrimp. Um, so 
the way I've organized these slides is just showing you some of the major groups of some of the groups of arthropods. So arachnids is what we saw here. These are the crustaceans, um, uh, which include shrimp and lobsters and sow bugs and things like that. And uh, here's another example of segmentation in action. It allowed for the evolution of flight in class Hexapoda, so kingdom, animalia, phylum, uh, um, arthropoda, class hexapoda, uh, or sometimes called class insecta. These are the insects, and this is the most abundant group of arthropods. Um, they have specialized segments that allow the development of wings, for example. And we see this group uh, all over the place. In fact, you can take a whole course on just this group. It's called entomology. I highly recommend you check that course out. So, this phylum is more diverse than all other forms of life combined, at least eukaryotes. I, I can't speak to the prokaryotes. Uh, they first show up in the Devonian, so this is... Uh, um, uh, actually, let me, let me rephrase that. Let me step back. I, I've, I've misspoke there. The insects are more diverse than all other forms of life. Um, the insects appear in the Devonian. That's after the Cambrian explosion, but the, the, the phylum... Um, Arthropoda appears in the Cambrian explosion, but by the Devonian, which is a little bit later in the Paleozoic, we have insects appearing. And then wings evolve, and then they really explode in terms of diversity. The evolution of wings allowed them to take advantage of new habitats. And, uh, and here we see a, a, a moth that looks like a hummingbird of all things. Isn't that cool? Um, so they, they diversified like crazy. After evolving wings, I have a question here. What other groups have evolved flight? Um, can you think of it? Can you think of them? There have been a few groups that have evolved flight. Insects, mammals, birds, and separately, the dinosaurs, uh, like the pterodactyls and things. Um, so we've evolved flight a few times on the planet. Um, insects have another adaptive radiation where they really increase in diversity after the evolution of flowering plants in the Mesozoic era as they co-evolved with plants and became pollinators uh, that allowed them to adapt to new food sources and things and you really see an explosion of diversity in that time period. Now this group uh, we're going to focus on the insects. They have internal fertilization which is really handy for life on land because you don't want sperm and egg just like laying on a rock somewhere. So when you have internal fertilization it greatly enhances your ability to colonize land and we see that evolving here in this group. Their young develop inside of waterproof eggs which allows them to be laid on land. So really well adapted to life on land. This is the most terrestrial group we've seen so far. Like earthworms can live on land but they live in wet spots underground. Insects can be all over the place in deserts. They can be in the dirt. They can be in the air. They're very well adapted to a terrestrial environment. As they grow, they shed their exoskeleton and, and form a new one. So we call this molting. Um, and they might change as they molt. And we call that process metamorphosis. And there are, let me go back here for a second. There's a couple kinds of metamorphosis. There's simple metamorphosis where the, the young look just like the adult but smaller and they just get bigger as they grow. That's simple metamorphosis. The young are called nymphs and the adult has a wing. And therefore we can tell the... the I'm sorry, in this case, the adult does not have a wing. I misspoke. But the ad adult is sexually mature is what makes it different from a nymph. And so a nymph are the sexually immature stages. And every one of these stages here shows you when it shed its skin, it molted and got bigger. Now, um, complete metamorphosis is shown here. Uh, this is when an organism starts as a larva, like a caterpillar, and then it becomes a pupa and emerges as an adult. Um, so we have a complete change in body plan, a complete change in feeding behavior and things like that. So this is important. This is advantageous for insects because in this case, when we have complete metamorphosis and a change in body plan, the larva have a completely different food source and habitat than the adults. The larvae in this case are eating leaves and plants. The adults might feed on pollen. They don't compete with their own children for food and resources and habitat. So this allows them to be more successful in the environment because the adults are not competing with their own children for food and habitat. So if we look at the diversity of life on Earth, this image shows you 
diversity uh, scaled to size. So you can see like mites and other arthropods are pretty big. Uh, turtles, you know, reptiles are kind of small. There's amphibians, birds, mammals, about that big. Mushroom, pretty, a lot of diversity there. Fish, quite a bit of diversity. But look at insects. Huge amounts of diversity in the insects. Uh, plants, quite a bit of diversity, but insects have tons of diversity. Uh, a very diverse group. The last group I'm going to end with on this video, so we don't have to make another one, uh, is the Echinodermata. These are the starfish and um, other echinoderms. Uh, this group has bilateral symmetry in the larvae, but adults have radial symmetry. So this is going to include your sea stars, your sea cucumbers, and your sea urchins. Um, they typically don't have a brain. Uh, they have ganglia and things. Uh, their ancestors apparently did have a brain because all, all the other animals we've talked about since uh, the flatworms and things have a brain. Their ancestors had one, but their radial lifestyle means they don't need to process information like a bilateral organism does, so they've lost their brain. But we call this secondary radial symmetry because their ancestors were, radially, um, were bilateral and they've re-evolved radial symmetry. Um, and they also have a calcium-rich endoskeleton, an internal skeleton, which we're going to see also in the chordates, an internal skeleton, endoskeleton. This group is unique in that it has um, what we call a water vascular system. You can see that here. Um, it pumps, they pump water around, filling up these things called tube feet, or the scientific name is papillae. Those tube feet inflate and deflate as they pump water into them, and that allows them to, uh, to, to wiggle their feet and move around. So they don't necessarily have a lot of muscles in here, but what they do is they pump water into those tube feet to fill them up and deflate them, allowing them to do some of their motion, some of their movement. Their endoskeleton is composed of calcium carbonate, and it's is covered with an epidermis. So they have an uh, internal skeleton. They have the water vascular system that allows them to move, extend, and retract those tube feet. That's a unique derived trait only found in this group. They also have intern or I'm sorry, an external form of reproduction. They're found in marine environments. Um, and they can, they're really good at regenerating asexually. If you cut a starfish in half, you tend to get two starfish developing after that. Um, so this group, by the way, is the closest group to the, to the chordates, our group. This is the sister taxon to our group, the chordates. Um, so what are the major trends then that we see when we look at all these animals we've talked about? Well, you know that all animals appear to share a common ancestor. Um, sponges are the sister group to all other animals. And uh, the eumetazoa, which is the clade that has true tissues, um, are the more dominant, the more common clade of animals. Um, most of those eumetazoans are in the clade bilateria. I'm not, bila, bi, yeah, bilateria, the bilateral animals. And most of the animals that we see are invertebrates, uh, animals without a backbone. Chordata, the last phylum we have to talk about yet, is the only phylum that has vertebrates, and uh, so therefore 95% of all animals lack vertebrae. And not even all chordates have vertebrae, so we'll talk about that in the next video. But these are, this is a great list, drop this down, the major trends of animal evolution. So we're going to pick up with chordates in the next set of lectures.